So much to be thankful for. Uh, I, I consider, you know, uh, just thinking about last, this past year, and just everything recently been going on. It's been so many things to be thankful for. This Thanksgiving, um, I wouldn't necessarily say more than others, but I just, uh, this Thanksgiving, I just know that there's a lot to be thankful for, uh, for my family and uh, for our church. And, uh, you know, one of the most beautiful psalms of uh, Thanksgiving is the 100th Psalm. I want to talk to you about that today. If you want to turn there, you can follow along. But uh, Psalms 100, Psalm 100, if you want to turn there or swipe on your phone or whatever you got going on, uh, Psalm 100, a beautiful, beautiful psalm. And I'll let you turn there and then we'll read that together. It says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name, for the Lord is good and His love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. With all my heart, I believe that we are a people, that you and I, we live in a nation, we are a nation that has truly, truly been blessed by God. And all of those who give thanks to Him and praise His name. It is God's people, of all the people, God's people. Our names should be at the top of the list of those that praise God. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not uncommon to compile the wish list for Christmas. Kids, how many of you guys got your wish list going already? All right, I got mine going too. And, um, or maybe some of us drop those New Year's resolutions at the time, you know, at the, the end of the year. Uh, but there's another list that I think we often overlook, and I think that's a Thanksgiving Day list. We should, be, we should be making a list of all the things we're thankful for. Every single one of us in this room, I don't care what your circumstance is uh, in life right now, you could make a list of, of many things, all the things that you and I are thankful for. You know, as a pastor, I, I, I guess, maybe I can, I'll take the moment right now, I can publicly, I just, maybe I want to give thanks right now. Um, to everyone, again, who supported my wife and my family through uh, the last few weeks. Uh, as I said, we haven't been taken care of. We've been spoiled rotten. And all of those here that uh, serve at River of Life in different ministries in some way, um, I'm thankful for you. I'm thankful for those of you that reached out to my wife and offered to come over and visit and, and to help out. And, and, I mean, it doesn't always work out, but, you know, just the reaching out to her um, is a blessing to her, and she's she's really overwhelmed by all of that, and um, you know. But there's a lot of things that even in the church ministries, a lot of things that go on behind the scenes that you don't necessarily always see. Um, we got Scott Green up there in the balcony. He's running the sound stuff, uh, the, the slideshow, and I've got my dad up there. He's these bright, these lights are bright. Um, I can make out the beard. I can see the beard. Up there. You can see Dad up there, and he's videotaping, so we can put the messages and service stuff on online. And yeah. <laughs> God said, "Dim the lights." <laughs> Dim the lights. So much to be thankful for. A lot of things behind the scenes. Nursery ministry, people clean the church, uh, the youth ministry. Uh, the, you know, we've got uh, our young youth, our junior youth ministry, things that go on, you know, so many things that happen not just on Sundays, um, just a lot of great things going on. And, and uh, as I said before, we've got our prayer ministry, and uh, we also have the nursing home ministry, and, and there's just so many things, so many things. Operation Christmas Child, um, River of Life Kenya, I got a text message this morning, just so you guys are aware, uh, Pastor Evans texted me and said they had five people except Christ this morning in service. And uh, right about, uh, right around 10.30, 10.45, they're getting home from their services. And he usually sends me a little update. And so, so many things, though, that we can be thankful for that go on. You know, those of you that use your time, talents, and gifts 
Um, those of you that give support, you know, financially, um, without your giving, ministry doesn't really happen here at the church. Um, the doors don't open, and um, uh, we don't have heat or electricity or anything like that, and air conditioning. And I want to thank those of you who have supported the church, supported our family personally in so many ways. Um, you just don't understand how much of an encouragement you've been. I, I can't even, I just, it's hard for me to even put it into words. I, um, thank you. And, uh, you know, I would say that our lists, mine and yours, could probably be very similar. Our list could be very much the same, but I'm convinced that if we began to make a list, we'd find that we have so much more to be thankful for than just material possessions. Um, like you, I think, I'm sure, my list would include the major things in life. You know, when we think about health, especially when your loved one or yourself has gone through a health situation, my goodness, you can be thankful for good health when you've got it. Uh, thankful for family, thankful for friends, the nation that we live in, despite some of the flaws that we see, the nation we live in, something to be thankful for. But even more than that, I'm thankful for, um, and I'm sure you would agree, your salvation. Amen. Thankful for my family, my church family in particular. I'm thankful for the mercy that God gives me that I need every day. Um, and with Jesus Christ in our lives, listen, we have a lot to celebrate this Thanksgiving. This Thursday, I encourage you to try and make that list. Try and make a list. And uh, just start somewhere. Start making that list. And uh, has it ever occurred to you that probably no other American, though, speaking of our country and our nation, probably no other Americans were more underprivileged than that handful of uh, folks on the Mayflower who started the, the custom of setting aside a day of thanksgiving to Almighty God. They didn't have homes. They didn't have a government agency to help them build homes at the time either. They had no means of transportation but their legs. Their only food came from the sea or the woods and the forest, and they had to get that for themselves. They had no money no place to spend the money, even if they had it. They had no entertainment that we like to enjoy except what they made for themselves. No means of real communication with their relatives back home in England. No social security, no retirement plans. But anyone who dared to call them underprivileged would have probably ended up in jail in the stocks at the time. Because what they did have was four of the greatest human assets you could have, and that is initiative, they had courage, they had a willingness to work, but most importantly, they had an unmatched faith in God, their creator God. You see, our forefathers, they had a boundless faith in Almighty God. That almost sounds strange today in a time when you have many powerful authorities and forces that are at work in our nation trying to strip us of, of, of Basically, every reminder that our very foundation of a country was actually founded on and built upon the conviction that we are a nation under God. And I'm not going to get political with you today. I'm just talking history a little bit. That's it. Our hollow declaration of independence actually proclaims this, and I quote, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And it ends with these words, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. People don't talk like that anymore today, do they? Thanksgiving Day is a very, very distinctive holiday. It doesn't uh, commemorate a battle or, or anyone's birthday or anyone's anniversary. It's simply a day that we set aside to express our nation's thanks to our Creator God, the God of the Bible. In uh, 1789, George Washington, he made a public proclamation. And I'm just going to read just a little part of it, but I want you to see he has very strong, a uh, very strong acknowledgement of the fact of God and of our nation's dependence upon God. 
And this is what he says, and I quote, By the President of the United States of America, a proclamation, Whereas it is the duty of all nations to acknowledge the providence of Almighty God, to obey His will, to be grateful for His benefits, and humbly to implore His protection and favor, and whereas both houses of Congress, did you hear that? Both houses of Congress have by their joint committee requested me to recommend to the people of the United States a day of public thanksgiving and prayer to be observed by acknowledging with grateful hearts the many signal favors of Almighty God. Amen. He goes on to say, Now therefore I do recommend and assign Thursday, the 26th day of November, next, to be devoted by the people of these states to the service of that great and glorious being who is the benefit, uh, the benefit, the beneficent author of all the good that was, that is, or that will be. So read the very first presidential Thanksgiving proclamation. So again, this week, Thursday, our nation is going to pause once again to celebrate Thanksgiving Day, and one would assume that because of the example of our forefathers, because today we have so very much so much to be thankful for that we would be extremely thankful people. And sometimes yet I feel like the opposite is true. Unfortunately, the more people get, the less thankful they sometimes become. The less mindful of God that they are. The less dependent upon Him and acknowledgement of Him they become. The more they want I think that the 100th Psalm that we just read was written to kind of deal with that attitude, believe it or not. To remind us, remind us of our need to be thankful and to be grateful. The 100th Psalm, if you take a look, you can read that again. Just kind of look at it, just kind of glance at it every now and then. The 100th Psalm was written for the people. Listen, they were, it was written for the people of Israel. Um, and God said to them, he says, he says, when you come into the promised land, basically, when you come here, and when you guys settle down here in your warm homes, and you have plenty to eat and plenty to drink, he says, don't forget about me. Don't forget about me and everything that I've done for you. I led you out of the wilderness. I've done all of these things, I've, all the miracles that I have, I have performed. I brought you into a land described as one that is flowing with milk and honey, but it doesn't take very long, does it? It doesn't take very long to realize the people of Israel, they, they needed a reminder, as they often did. They would go through these, these times, these seasons, and I'm afraid that sometimes you and I need that same reminder to be thankful, to be grateful. And maybe God has, has us or had us in mind, you know, when the psalm was written. I don't know if you noticed it, who it was addressed to. It says, the very first verse says it was addressed to who? All the earth. All the earth, right? And then the last verse, it includes what? All generations. All the earth and all generations. That's who it was written to. Uh, it looks like it includes us. And this message of thanksgiving, it's so deep, it's so wide. You know what it applies to? It applies to every person, every era, every stage of life. It doesn't matter your economic status. It doesn't matter what plant, part of the, the globe, the planet that you were born on. It is for all of us. It was written for all. This message of thanksgiving is for everyone. And I think that there's a real danger sometimes. There's a danger in, in the season, this season, of determining our thanksgiving based upon, listen, based upon how much we have. That's the danger. Should I be thankful? Am I thankful right now? Well, let's see. Let me make a list of all the things that I possess. All of my material possessions. Or even just, well, do I have enough turkey to gorge myself sufficiently this year? Do I have enough in the bank? Is my money in the bank secure? Am I healthy? And we start to let these kinds of things determine whether or not we should or should not be thankful. I mean, when I mention making a list, isn't that kind of what we start thinking about is all the things we have or don't have, right? 
And the psalmist says that all of these things may change. Those things come and go. They change over time. They may drift away. They burn up. Uh, someone might steal some of that stuff. Uh, the enemy comes in and tries to steal things from us. The only thing we have for sure is our relationship with the Lord. Amen. That's what we know for sure. And that is what the 100th Psalm emphasizes. Just, I mean, just scan through the psalm. In verse 1, you find the name of the Lord. Verse 2, you'll find the name of the Lord. Verse 3, you find the name of the Lord. Verse 4, enter his gates with thanksgiving. Verse 5, you find the name of the Lord. The basis of our thanksgiving, the foundation of our thanksgiving, is the Lord. It's not our stuff. It's not even my health. It's the Lord. That's the basis of our thanksgiving. The basis of our thankfulness to remember that we got here with the help of our God. Alex Haley, he was the author of Roots. He had an unusual picture hanging on his office wall. It was a picture of a turtle on top of a fence post. And when asked, he said, uh, they asked him, you know, why is that there? And Alex Haley answered, he said, every time I write something significant, every time I read my words and I think that they're wonderful and I begin to feel a little proud of myself, I look at the turtle on top of that fence post and I remember he didn't get up there by himself. <laughs> We're very much the same, aren't we? We need to remember, be thankful that we didn't get to where we are. We don't have salvation. We don't have the Lord apart from God. The Lord is the basis and the foundation of our thankfulness. Now, there's a few commands I want you to note with me this morning as we look a little bit more, a little bit more in depth in this psalm. We find there's a series of, of, of thoughts, commands, principles here given. And the first one is this. In verse 1, he says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Shout for joy. That's the first command. Everybody say shout. Shout. Okay, let's shout and shout. Shout. There we go. we got a couple of shouters in here. Shout. It means... To shout with the force of a trumpet blast. All right? I mean, that's, so that's a shout, right? That's what that word means. This is a, a blast. I mean, you're letting it rip, you know? A shout for joy to the Lord comes from the very depths of your being. I mean, you're shouting here. And that's what he's saying. Shout for joy. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. And maybe, maybe he solved your problem, right? Maybe God has given you directions and how to go and how to deal with something in your in your life. Maybe he's given you provided a blessing for you and your family or you realize that that it, you know it's come from God. Whatever it is, you realize that. So from the depths of your being now, you're going to shout for joy to the Lord. That's what it is. There's a pastor, he tells about a vet, a veteran missionary. Uh, he came to him one day after he had delivered his sermon. The missionary introduced himself. He said, you know, I was a medical missionary for many years in India. And he said he served in a region where there was progressive blindness going on. So people were born with perfectly healthy vision, perfectly healthy eyesight. But then there was something in the area where those folks were living that caused people to just start losing their sight over time as they grew older. But this missionary had developed this special treatment which would stop progressive blindness, literally stop it in his tracks. And so people would come to him and he would perform this treatment, right? His, his special treatment. And they would, um, and they would leave and realizing that, that they would have become completely blind if it wasn't for this treatment. And, uh, you know, they would have completely lost all of their sight, um, but their sight has now been saved because of this guy's treatment. And he had never, he, sa he said that, that they never said thank you to him. And the guy said, well, why not? He said, well, it's kind of simple. Um, that phrase wasn't actually in their dialect. So they couldn't say thank you. It just wasn't a part of their language. And instead, they spoke a word that meant this. I will tell your name. And so these people would leave knowing that their sight was saved. And they would go around. Instead of saying thank you, they would instead go to everybody else. And they would tell his name. And that's what they did. Wherever they went, they would tell the name of the missionary who had cured their blindness. They had received something that was so awesome to them. They were so eager to proclaim it, they went out 
and they told his name. And that's what the psalmist is saying. Suddenly you realize that God has been so good to you that you cannot keep it inside anymore and you just have to go and tell the name of the Lord. Proclaim the name of the Lord. From the depths of your being, shout for joy unto the Lord. Amen. The second thing is this. It says, serve the Lord like you've been sucking on green persimmons your whole life. No, no, not that, not that. It says, serve the Lord with gladness, right? You ever go into a church and you see a bunch of people who are like, oh, no. Serve the Lord with gladness. If you're going to serve God, <laughs> you might as well do it with joy, amen? You might as well do it with some gladness. Serve the Lord with gladness, he says. It doesn't say serve the church, by the way. It doesn't say serve the pastor, uh, as much as I would love for you guys just to obey me all the time and just do whatever I command. You know, at home, uh, I, you know, my kids, uh, they don't call me uh, pastor and dad. They call me master, just so you guys know. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I will tell you a funny story. So I, when I first started pastoring a church, this little kid came into the church. He walked up the stairs of the foyer, and he looks up at me and says, Good morning, Master Larry. I said, Master Larry? Oh, I can get used to that. <laughs> his, parents, his parents said, now, he thinks it's a joke now because for the longest time, he thought everybody was calling me Master Larry. He didn't know Pastor. He thought Master was, well, that was the normal term. Oh, that, was, that was so funny. I, I got a kick out of that. Well, we serve the Lord with gladness, not the church, not me, not somebody else. We serve the Lord with gladness, right? It says serve the Lord. The Bible teaches that if we witness on behalf of the Lord, if we feed the hungry, if we clothe uh, those that, that, that need to be clothed that are naked, if we do the work of the Lord, whatever that might be, whatever that might look like, the Bible says that we are actually serving the Lord as if we were literally serving Him. That is a wonderful thing. That's a beautiful picture. Matthew 25 and 40, Jesus said, Inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. I'm not sure that we grasp that completely, but maybe we serve at times out of a feeling of obligation. Maybe a fear of guilt. If we don't serve, you know, maybe somebody's going to look down at us. Or maybe even, you know, God forbid it's because we want to draw attention to ourselves. I don't know. I don't know where you're at. But I say serve as though you're serving the Lord, and that'll take care of a lot of that. Just serve Him. Just serve the Lord. It's natural, I think, a lot of times for us in the flesh to desire appreciation when we do something that, that is worthwhile and for people to come and maybe give us a little bit of praise. And, and I'm not against people you know, encouraging each other and, and thanking each other and praising one another. That's okay. I'm not saying that. The motivation is what I'm talking about. The motivation of why you're doing it. That's what we're talking about here. And whatever we do, serve the Lord with gladness. Not for those other things. Not for the other stuff. Now the third thing is this. Come before Him, He says, with joyful songs. A little bit like we did this morning. We came to Him with joyful songs. Psalm 98, 4 says, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Now that I can do. I may not be able to make a beautiful noise unto the Lord, but I can make a joyful noise unto Him. Alright? And I'm sure that God sees my heart and doesn't hear my voice. And that's what I'm counting on. That's what I'm counting. It's a joyful noise from the heart. But have you ever noticed this? Have you ever noticed in the, the first three commands here, God has said, basically, I want you to be happy. Think about those first three things. He wants you to be happy. Right? Shout with joy. Serve with gladness. Right? And make joyful sounds unto Him. He wants you to be happy. He doesn't want you to be sad. He wants you to have joy. He wants you to be glad in what you're doing as we serve Him. You ever notice that? God wants you to be happy, believe it or not. Now just take a moment. I want you to look at the people around you. Just take a look. Look up. Look up. Take a look at everybody. Don't look at me anymore. Don't look at me. No, you're looking at me. Don't look at me. I caught you. Look at the people around you. Does everybody look happy? I hope. Everybody got a smile on your face? I see lots of smiles now. You're like, this is awkward. He just made me feel uncomfortable. Pastor Larry, you know I don't like people in big 
crowds anyway. Why are you making me look at people? They're looking at me. They're looking at me. <laughs> I didn't see anybody with a scowl on their face. That's a good thing. The psalmist says, come before him and serve him and sing his praise with joy in your heart. Sing with joy in your heart. Amen. You know, the other command is this. Know that the Lord is God, that it is he who made us, that we are his, we are his people, and we are the sheep of his pasture. That's what he says, right? God took every bone, he took every joint, uh, he wields them all together with tendons and muscles, and he covers them with skin, he gave us eyes that can see, brains that think, some a little bit better than others, fingers that can... <laughs> Brooklyn thought that was funny. <laughs> are you thinking of one of your sisters? <laughs> all right. <laughs> He takes all that stuff and he melds us all together, right? He fits us all together into this, well, you know what he does? He, he puts us together and makes us exactly the way he wants us. Amen. Maybe not the way you want, but you're the way he wants you. He has made you exactly the way he wants you. And it really is beautiful to look out and see all the different kinds of people and all their different personalities and it's just so neat to look at and see how God uses all of us as he builds his kingdom. It's just an amazing thing. You are the way that God wants you to be. And that's a mystery, I mean, isn't it? I mean, I, I don't understand why, but somehow in God's providence, he decided that he wanted a, a medium-sized guy, not outstanding at anything, just trying to be a good dad, trying to be a good husband, and just keeps plodding along. That's me. So he made me, right? Just uh, an average guy. Um, someplace along the way, he had you in mind. And he made you just the way you are. And it really is a beautiful thing. God's our maker. We are created in his image. And therefore, we need to give him thanks for who we are. Amen. Give him thanks for who you are. Because every time, I want you to think about this, every time we look in the mirror, every time we think those discouraging thoughts about ourselves, remember that you and I can actually criticize the fact that God created us. Remember, he's the, he's the artist. He's the one that made me. He's the one that made you. Be happy about that. Be joyful and glad about that. Be good with the fact that he created you the way you are in his image. Lastly, this morning, he tells us there in Psalm 100, it says there, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, right, and praise his name, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Now, you know, go back up one little bit. I forgot this one. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Let me hit that real quick. Because he says there, again, we're his people, right? We're his, we're the sheep of his pasture. The problem is that most of us, we don't want, we want to be shepherds. We don't want to be sheep. You and I both know the sheep are probably the dumbest animals on the planet. Nobody wants to be a sheep. We all want to be shepherds, right? It's not fun all the time being a sheep, right? Sheep are, are, are not the, the brightest. But the problem is, is that we don't know... Uh, where the, we don't always know where the still waters are. We don't always know where the green pastures are. Sometimes we think they're over there and they're not. It's not really greener on the other side of the fence, you know what I mean? And every time we go out searching for those green pastures, a lot of times we end up out in the far country, just way out, way out by ourselves. But we need to be careful about that. We're his sheep. And he's saying, you be the sheep. Let me be the shepherd. I'll be the one to lead you over to the water that you need and over to the green pastures that you need. Just let me lead. And you follow. And then again, enter his gates with thanksgiving, his courts with praise, giving thanks to him. He says, praise his name, right? For the Lord is good, his love endures forever, his faithfulness continues through all generations. You know the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, the temple, the temple symbolized presence of God. So when people would go into the temple, they would enter the courtyard, 
They knew that they were entering, they were going to a place where the presence of God was at. They were entering his courts. They were entering a place where they knew his presence was going to be and was. And now that temple, you know what, that no longer exists in that sense in the Old Testament time. But oftentimes the place where we meet and, you know, we meet, we worship God together in a place like this, we call this room, we call it a sanctuary, don't we? We call this the sanctuary. We're indicating that God is here. But it's not because it's called a sanctuary. That's not why God is here. That's not why the Holy Spirit is here with us today. That's not why, because we simply call this area a sanctuary. God is everywhere. Remember that. He's, he's, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. We know that. He is with us when we drive on the highway. <laughs> Some of you guys are okay with that thought. Some of you guys aren't. He's with you when you're at home by yourself, or with your family. He's with you everywhere you go. He's with you when you go to work. He's with you as you care for your children. He's with you every single moment of your life. And as a Christian, the presence of God's Holy Spirit is living and residing within you. It's within you, okay? It's, he's, he's, he's a part of you. He's in you, okay? It puts a completely different perspective on the time that God told Moses, hey, Moses at the burning bush, I want you to remove your sandals because the place you're standing on is holy ground, holy ground because the presence of God was there. That puts a completely different perspective on the idea if the Holy Spirit and God is present within each life of every believer, are we always standing on holy ground? Always on holy ground. The presence of God is with us all the time. God's presence is always with us. Does that mean that we are always standing on holy ground? I want to think about that. That is the source of our thanksgiving, isn't it? The Lord is the source. I'm worried, though, that oftentimes, what if, well, what if God, let's, let's just do this. What if God began to treat us the way that we sometimes treat Him? What would that look like? What if God met our needs to the same extent that we give Him our lives? What if we never saw another flower bloom because we grumbled when God sent the rain? What if God stopped loving and caring for us because we failed to love and care for others? What if God took away His message because we wouldn't listen to His messenger? What if he wouldn't bless us today because we didn't thank Him yesterday. What if God answered our prayers the way we answered His call for service? And what if God decided to stop leading us tomorrow because we did not follow Him today? Psalm 103.10 says, O oh Lord, help us to be thankful that You do, He says, not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our own iniquity. You know, I pray that this Thanksgiving season, uh, th this time, this Thanksgiving season this year, that you and all your family, that it'll be a meaningful one. That it'll be a meaningful Thanksgiving. I, I encourage you to take the time, just maybe this Thanksgiving, just to maybe read the 100th Psalm again, together as a family even. And if you'll hear and follow those thoughts, I would say that your heart's going to overflow with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving to the Lord who is the foundation of our gratitude and our heartfelt thanks. This morning we offer His invitation to you. I invite you to open your heart to God this morning.